Thank you very much, Mr. Bradick, and good Sabbath to everyone. As was mentioned in the sermonette today, this is the time where we are doing uh, any perhaps even more intense self-examination, preparing for the Passover, uh, weeding out the leaven, if you will, the sin in our lives, and um, preparing ourselves so that we can take the Passover in a worthy manner. And as the Passover approaches, there are some who, again, are going back and re-examining the observance of Passover itself. And so there's a long-standing debate among some as to which day Christians should keep the Passover ceremony. And there are some who most, I should say, most believe that it should be kept on the 14th of Nisan, which is the 14th of Abib. And um, this has been observed by faithful people of God for more than 3,000 years. And then there are some who believe that the Passover should be kept on the 15th. And this has been a tradition of many for more than 2,000 years. And then there are others who keep the Passover on the 14th, but they believe that God originally intended for the Passover to be kept on the 15th. And then, therefore, Christ moved this date, supposedly moved this date to the 14th, the day before he was crucified. And so which day should the Christian Passover ceremony be observed? And can we be certain of which day it is to be observed? The answer is we can. And let's go ahead and open up first to 1 Corinthians in chapter 11, 1 Corinthians 11. This is perhaps going to be a little bit of a technical sermon, which I uh, tend to be known for at times, but I think it is important for us to realize because we live in a time where knowledge has increased on many levels, and even within the Church of God in recent decades, knowledge has increased to a degree. And we have the foundation, of course, laid by the apostles and Christ being the chief cornerstone and in the last century, we have the work of Herbert Armstrong, which uh, revealed or reinstituted a great many truths, reinstated, I should say, a great many truths under the Church of God who, what, that had been lost for quite some time. And so we stand on his shoulders, don't we, to a large degree. But there has been, in recent years, a deeper understanding of some prophecies and of certain doctrine. And because of the apostasy that took place 30 years ago or so, and the enormous amount of knowledge that we have access to, there are some that are, have become unsatisfied, if you will, with the truths that the Church of God has taught and with what we believe. Many have become fascinated by extra-biblical writings and traditions of men turning to spurious works and even to Jewish writings in an attempt to gain a further understanding of the scriptures. But we find that such writings do not always fall into line with the Bible, do they? In fact, we find many of these writings frequently contradict the scriptures. And so speaking of the Passover ceremony, Paul had written to the New Testament church in verse 27 of 1 Corinthians 11, that whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. And so this can apply to several manners of taking the Passover. Unworthily could mean partaking of the bread and the wine lightheartedly, not discerning the body of the Lord. It could involve not considering the magnitude of what this event represents. Those who are not baptized and proceed to partake of the symbols would fall into this category. But it can also include using the wrong symbols, misusing the bread or the wine as a method of self-indulgence, as Paul relates in this chapter, in this book. And it can also include observing the Passover at the rock, wrong time or on the wrong day. And so we want to be sure, don't we? And we want our people to be sure that they can trust the day that the eternal Church of God chooses to observe the Passover ceremony. In fact, it is not even our choice, is it? It is a direction, a command from God. 
And so let's go back to Ezra 6 to begin looking at some of these issues. Ezra in chapter 6. Many today are choosing to follow the Jewish practice of keeping Passover on the 15th of Abib. Also corresponding to the 15th of Nisan. These are used interchangeably. It's the same time on the calendar, the Hebrew calendar. So the 15th observance is related to the second temple period when Judah began moving away from a domestic observance of Passover and they began having Levites kill the Passover lambs on behalf of the people. And so the time spent constructing the second temple after the return of Judah and some of the other tribes into the area of Jerusalem, this time spent during this reconstruction, it was a mixture of zeal and apathy. And it took much longer than expected for them to finish the temple. And in fact, it required Nehemiah and others to come down to put the people back on track because they were falling away from doing the work and not tithing as they should and causing the Levites who were required to work due to the temple ministry to go out and get other jobs instead of doing the job that they were uh, commanded to do. But after the second temple was finished, finally finished, in Ezra in chapter 6, and we're going to begin reading in verse 19, there was, people were excited, and they wanted to keep the Passover in a spirit of zeal and faithfulness to God. And it says in verse 19 of chapter 6 that the descendants of the captivity kept the Passover on the 14th day of the first month. For the priests and the Levites had purified themselves, all of them were ritually clean, and they slaughtered the Passover lambs for all the descendants of the captivity, for their brethren, the priests, and for themselves. So we see here the Levites slaughtering the lambs instead of people doing it with their families, in their neighborhoods, in their homes. In verse 21, then the children of Israel who ate, who, excuse me, the children of Israel who had returned from the captivity ate together with all who had separated themselves from the filth of the nations of the land in order to seek the eternal God of Israel. And they kept the Feast of Unleavened Bread seven days with joy, for the eternal made them joyful and turned the heart of the king of Assyria toward them to strengthen their hand in the work of the house of God, the God of Israel. So the Passover was supposed to be, God desired for it to be a domestic observance. The lamb was to be set apart from the rest. A, a lamb without blemish was to be chosen and set apart from the rest. And it was to be kept by the family in the home for four days, set apart on the tenth, kept apart for four days. It was given no food or water so that it would become clean internally. And on the fourteenth, after the sun had set, on the evening of the fourteenth, it was then to be slain. But here we have the Levites slaughtering all the Passover lambs for the people who then ate the sacrifices in groups. Commentator John Gill, which is one of the commentators I uh, um, like the most personally, he wrote this. He says that this seems to have been done for all the people who were not so pure as the priests and Levites, or otherwise they might have killed it themselves. And he refers to Exodus 12 and verse 6. So scholars recognize that this was not how it was to be done. And even though it was a, it was a uh, something that was somewhat zealous and somewhat righteous to some degree, this was not how God commanded the Passover to be kept. But the people, it says, were deemed to be unworthy of killing the Passover lamb on their own. And this wasn't the first time that such a decision was made. If you'd go over to Second Chronicles, Second Chronicles in chapter 30, back a few pages. King Hezekiah was Israel's second greatest king after King David, when, that is when it comes to faith, when it comes to uh, passion for God. He was a good man. He revered God, respected his ways, but Hezekiah was not perfect in his ways. Nonetheless, he did try very hard to restore faithful behavior and to unite the tribes under God. Now, on one such occasion here in 2 Chronicles, in chapter 30, and in verse 1, 
after Hezekiah sent to all Israel and Judah and also wrote letters to Ephraim and Manasseh that they should come to the house of the Eternal at Jerusalem to keep the Passover to the Eternal God of Israel. For the king and his leaders and all the assembly in Jerusalem had agreed to keep the Passover in the second month. In other words, this is a time of national crisis. People were not on track. They were not clean spiritually. But they wanted to come back to God, or at least many of them did. And so they decided, we, you know, God gave us the opportunity to keep the Passover in the second month if for some dire reason we were unable to keep it in the first. And so they understood it, and they wanted to apply this here. Verse 3, For they could not keep it at the regular time because a sufficient number of priests and had not consecrated themselves, nor had the people gathered together at Jerusalem. They didn't have a passion for God. And the matter pleased the king and all the assembly. So they resolved to make a proclamation throughout all Israel from Beersheba to Dan that they should come to keep the Passover to the eternal God of Israel at Jerusalem since they had not done it for a long time in the prescribed manner. And so they sent runners throughout all Israel and Judah with the letters from the king and his leaders and spoke according to the command of the king. Children of Israel, return to the eternal God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. And then he will return to the remnant of you who have escaped from the hand of the kings of Assyria. And so there's this, these letters going out to all the people. This is a crisis here. We want people to get back on track with God. Let's get back to our roots. Let's get, come to the temple in Jerusalem. Let's establish, reestablish our covenant with God. Let's keep the Passover in sincerity and truth. And in verse 10, so the runners passed from city to city throughout the country of Ephraim and Manasseh as far as Zebulun, but many of them laughed at them and they mocked them. Nevertheless, some from Asher, Manasseh, Zebulun humbled themselves. They came to Jerusalem and the hand of God was on Judah to give them singleness of heart to obey the command of the king and the leaders at the word of the eternal. And many people, a very great assembly, gathered at Jerusalem to keep the Feast of Unleavened Bread in the second month. Now notice it says to keep the Feast of Unleavened Bread in the second month, not just the Passover. And so they arose, they took away the altars that were in Jerusalem, they took away all the incense altars, they cast them into the brook of Kidron. Then they slaughtered the Passover lambs on the 14th day of the second month. The priests, the Levites were, Levites were ashamed and sanctified themselves and brought the burnt offerings to the house of the Eternal. And they stood in their place according to their custom, according to the law of Moses, meaning where they were to be during these offerings, the man of God. And the priests sprinkled the blood, received them from the hand of the Levites. And there were many in the assembly who had not sanctified themselves. And therefore, the Levites had charge of the slaughter of the Passover lambs and everyone who was not clean to sanctify them to the eternal. For a multitude of people, many from Ephraim, Manasseh, Issachar, and Zebulun had not cleansed themselves, yet they ate the Passover contrary to what was written. But Hezekiah prayed for them, saying, May the good Lord provide atonement for everyone. Who appears, or excuse me, who prepares his heart to seek God, the eternal God of his fathers, though he is not cleansed according to the purification of the sanctuary. And the eternal listened to Hezekiah and healed the people. And so the children of Israel who were present at Jerusalem kept the feast of unleavened bread seven days with great gladness, and the Levites and the priests praised the eternal day by day, singing to the eternal, accompanied by loud instruments. And Hezekiah gave encouragement to all the Levites who taught the good knowledge of the eternal. And they ate throughout the feast seven days, offering peace offerings and making confession to the eternal God of their fathers. And then the whole assembly agreed to keep the feast another seven days. And they kept it another seven days with gladness. And so this may seem like an inspiring, a righteous moment for Israel. And in some ways... It was, but they did not keep the Passover according to God's instructions. And the historian even wrote that they did it contrary to what was written. And so they had changed it at this point from a domestic observance to a public activity. They did not consume it in a proper manner, it says, so it could have been that they did not consume it with unleavened bread and bitter herbs, or maybe they included additional items 
or uh, ingredients. They kept it in the second month, which got, is allowed in a time of crisis, but it says they attached a seven-day feast of unleavened bread to it. This is not allowed in God's inclusion. He says if anyone is unable to keep the Passover in the first month, they will keep it with the same rites, meaning doing it the same way, the same lamb, the same bread, the same bitter herbs, 30 days later in the second month on the 14th. But they attached a seven-day feast to it. And then, in addition to this, they attached another seven days on top of their festival. And this was not sanctioned by God. You see, Hezekiah may have been zealous, and he was a decent man, don't get me wrong, but the decree came by the king's command, not by God's commandment. And so the point is, for us, is that the priests here, they took it upon themselves to choose when and how to prepare the Passover, the priests along with the king here. And this happened again during the reign of Josiah. And this is shown, and I won't go there and read it, but you can look at it later, Second Chronicles in chapter 35, the king Josiah tried to regain some moral ground with God, but his administration, they chose to took it, they took it upon themselves to change the time and to change the method in which the Passover was observed. And so the tradition unto Ezra's day during the time of the second temple was also passed down to the Jews or the Levites of Christ's day. And so that is what was taking place on the day of Christ's crucifixion when they were slaughtering lambs for Passover. It was not the proper time to slaughter the Passover lamb, but it had become a tradition of the Jews to have the Levites slaughter the lambs on behalf of the people as opposed to people doing it domestically in their homes. And instead of doing it the evening prior, the evening of the 14th, they had moved to doing it the day of the 14th. So this tradition it caused the Jews to merge the Passover ceremony with the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And so in Christ's time, many Jews were keeping Passover the day of the 14th by having the Levites kill the lambs for the people, and then they would proceed to eat the lamb the evening of the 15th. As the sun set on the day of the 14th, they would begin the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and they would eat the Passover lamb at that time. Now, Josephus wrote about this, uh, this version of keeping the Passover during this period of time in one of his books, War of the Jews, or Wars of the Jews, in book 6, chapter 9, and verse 3. He wrote, So these priests, upon the coming of the feast, which is called Passover, when they slay the sacrifices from the ninth hour till the eleventh, and ninth is speaking from the time of 6 a.m., the time of basically the time of sunrise, and they would count forward nine. So beginning at 3, 3 p.m., they would kill Passover lambs until the eleventh, which is 5 p.m., but so that a company not less than ten belong to every sacrifice for it is not lawful for them to feast singly by themselves. And so basically it is saying that they were eating the Passover lamb in groups of 10 or larger. And many of us, he said, are 20 in a company. They found the number of the sacrifices during this particular Passover was 256,500. 256, That's how many lambs they sacrificed during this period of time. A lot of people were, were slaying the lamb at one time, a lot of Levites. Upon the allowance of no more than 10 that feast together amounts to 2,700,200 persons that were pure and holy. For as to those that have the leprosy or the gonorrhea or women that have their monthly courses or such as are otherwise polluted, it is not lawful for them to be partakers of this sacrifice. So Paul related that we are not to take partake of the Passover unworthily. But this does not mean that women who are in the process of their menstrual cycle cannot partake of the Passover at that time. It doesn't mean that people that who might have a little bit of a sniffle or a sore throat cannot take the Passover at that time. That's not biblical. I mean, the Jews were notorious for adding to or taking away from the scriptures, and we see this by the words of Josephus. 
And so deeming the people unworthy to kill a Passover lamb at home was a change that they had made, a change they had made from God's instructions to have it done domestically. John in chapter 18, the Passover was meant to be a domestic ceremony, something to be kept by family, by the family, or perhaps even a few families in the neighborhood together. But this came, became lost to the Jews. Even unto this day, it is lost to them. And so at, now, at this time, people that practice Judaism, they keep the Passover on the 15th at evening, and they do it with the traditional meal that they call a Seder. And this is noted in their oral tradition of the Mishnah, where it says this, Wherein does the Passover of Egypt differ from the Passover of the generations that followed after? At the Passover of Egypt, the lamb was gotten on the 10th of Nisan, sprinkling the blood on that, um, with a bunch of hyssop was required on the lintel and on the two side posts, and it was eaten in haste during one night, whereas the Passover of the generations that followed after continued throughout seven days. So you see what they had done. They had merged the Passover, which was a, a separate observance. They had combined it with the seven days of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So they, they, they'll admit, yes, that's how it was done originally. But now we do it this way. But where's the command? Where is the change in God's command to do it that way? There is none. It was done by their tradition. So they merged the Passover with the first day of the feast. And because the first day is a holy day, Jews try very hard not to become defiled during that day, during the 14th, during the daytime, so that they will be considered uh, pure in order that they might eat of the lamb or the Seder, as they call it today, that evening. And so this is reflected in John in chapter 18, where the apostle recorded the day after Christ and his disciples kept the Passover. And as Christ was enduring his illegal trial before he was scourged and crucified, in John 18 and verse 28, it says that they led Jesus from Caiaphas to the Praetorium. And the Praetorium was an area of the Gentiles where the Romans uh, were um, gathered. And it was early morning. But they themselves, speaking of the Jews, they did not go into the Praetorium, lest they should be defiled, but they might eat the Passover. So they didn't want to be defiled by going to this area because they planned on keeping the Passover that evening as opposed to when Christ and the disciples kept it the evening prior. And yet it says they didn't want to do this so that they could uh, partake of the tradition instead of the command. So there were obviously two Passovers that were kept at that time, and one of them was legitimate, while the other was not. Now Christ told his disciples the day before to prepare the Passover the evening prior, so that they may eat before he was crucified the following day. And this indicates to us when the Passover should be observed. But again, the Jews did something different. They had pushed God's command to do it the evening prior to the next day, and they merged it with the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Now let's look at Luke in chapter 22. Luke 22. What confuses some is the fact that the Feast of Unleavened Bread is called Passover in the Scriptures, and Passover is frequently included in the Feast. Separate as these two observances are, or may be, they are intimately connected. There's no denying that. As an example of this interchangeable way or expressions of referring to that spring Holy Day season, Luke 22, and in verse 1, it says, Now the Feast of Unleavened Bread drew near, which is called Passover. So we see how they are show, they're relate, the Luke is relating. They are, they are the same thing, in, to, in a sense. That means they, they occur successively. Let's go over to John 13. Luke is not the only author who pointed out that the seven-day Feast of Unleavened Bread 
is connected to the first observance, the Passover ceremony. This is nothing new, actually. And uh, even in the Old Testament books, the expressions are used interchangeably at times. But this does not mean that the Passover ceremony should be observed during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And John chapter 13 documents a conversation taking place during Christ and the disciples' last Passover together, that faithful night. John 13 and verse 1 it says, Now before the feast of Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And then supper being ended, and it, the devil having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot. And it goes on to tell the story of his, his betrayal. So here Christ and the disciples are in the midst of observing the Passover meal. In fact, they're finishing the Passover meal. And yet it says that this was the time before the feast of the Passover. And what it means is that this event was before the feast portion of the Passover season, before the first high day had begun because the feast wouldn't begin until the following evening. Let's go to John 19. John 19. And this is the next day when Christ's illegal trial and wrongful conviction occurred. In John 19 and in verse 14, now it was the preparation day of the Passover and about the sixth hour being noon and he said to the Jews behold your king so here it is called the preparation day of the Passover and yet Passover was already kept by Christ the evening prior well again the reason is because of this interchangeable use of Passover and Feast of Unleavened Bread that includes both periods of time. And so the day before a high day, which is likened to a Sabbath, is called a preparation day. And we're quite familiar with this. The sixth day of the week, yesterday, was considered a preparation day for observing the Sabbath. And in John 19 and verse 31, Therefore, because it was the preparation day, that is the day before the first high day of unleavened bread, the body should not remain on the cross that on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath, it says, was a high day. So the point is, don't let the term, when the use of the term Passover is, takes place in the scriptures, do not let it cause you to think that Passover should be observed during the day portion of the 14th or on the 15th, or that Passover was not observed by Christ and the disciples the evening prior, because Christ is the model citizen of the kingdom of God. He was a righteous man who did not violate a single command, and he showed us exactly when the Passover should be observed. And not only did he spell it out to us with his own words, he actually showed us by doing it. Let's look at Exodus 12 now. Exodus 12. We're going to cover this chapter this next week in a more detail, of course, but I do want to point out a couple of parts where this Passover observance is instituted or reinstituted, if you will. Regardless of what was done by the Jews, at that time or now, the fact remains that God commanded Passover to be kept on the evening beginning the 14th. And as we know, the days according to God begin in the evening. The evening and the morning were the first day. The evening and the morning were the second day. The evening and the morning were the third, fourth, fifth, and so on. We know, this is common knowledge among God's people, that the evening begins a day, which was when Passover was to be observed. Now notice the first instructions here in Exodus 12, and beginning in verse 1. Now the Eternal spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be your beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. What month are they talking about? It's, it's, it literally does mean month here, not moon. And it's the month of Abib, as we see, as we read in uh, the next chapter. But 
Let's just read this now. Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying on the tenth of this month, every man shall take for himself a lamb according to the house of his father, a lamb for a household. But if the household is too small for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to his house take it according to the number of persons, according to each man's need. You shall make your count for the lamb. And your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year, and you may take it you may take it from the sheep or from the goats. Now you shall keep it until the fourteenth day of the same month, and then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight. Some translations say even or evening. And they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses where they shall eat, and then they shall eat the flesh that night. Roasted in fire with unleavened bread and with bitter herbs, they shall eat it. So these are explicit details regarding the Passover lamb, how it was to be treated, when it was to be taken into the house, when it was to be killed. And God said that the lamb was to be killed at twilight on the 14th. Now, this means the evening that begins the 14th. Strong's Exhaustive Concordance, the Bible relates that the word translated as twilight or even is the Hebrew word Arab, and it means dusk. This means after the sun has set, but there's still light out for about an hour, roughly an hour's worth of time. The period of time between sunset and dark is when the lamb was to be killed, when the lamb was to be prepared and uh, made ready for roasting. Now, clearly, this is when the 14th had begun, at sunset. But if you still question this definition here, and I'm not going to go through this. I could spend five minutes or ten minutes going through it, but examine Exodus chapter 16. Exodus 16, roughly verse 8, and read forward. This, but I would read it from the beginning of the chapter, because this chapter, that chapter, I should say, it discusses God given, giving um, Israel the manna, and it discusses giving them quail to eat. And he gave them the quail to eat at Arab, twilight or even, evening. It was the evening after a Sabbath had ended. It was after sunset, but before dark. And this is important for us to understand when the Passover lamb was to be slain. It was to be slain after sunset and then roasted and eaten that night, not the following day in the afternoon and not on the 15th, which became a tradition of the Jews. In Exodus, in chapter 12, verses 14 through 20, I'm not going to read it, but God gave the instructions then for the observance of seven days of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. But let's go over to Leviticus 23, very familiar chapter when speaking about the holy days, discussing them and uh, God's instructions and his intent. Because if it wasn't clear enough for us so far, God spells it out a second time in Leviticus 23 and in verse 5, where he said that on the 14th day of the first month at twilight or Arab evening, it is, this is the Lord's Passover. And on the 15th day of the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Seven days you will eat unleavened bread, beginning the feast. So this set of instructions is repeated a third time, and I won't go there, but you can put a note in your Bible if you want, Numbers 28, verses 16 through 25. On the 14th day of the first month is the Passover of the Eternal. And on the 15th day of this month is the Feast, a fifth Feast of Unleavened Bread, it shall be eaten for seven days. And it goes on to say that the first day of this feast shall be a holy convocation and the seventh day shall be a holy convocation where you do no customary work. So these verses indicate that there are two events that take place successively. There is the Passover ceremony that takes place, the evening of the 14th. And then there is the seven-day Feast of Unleavened Bread that begins the evening of the 15th. And so in this way, this first feast of the year, this first set of holy days, is much like the last set of holy days. They're like bookends, if you will, on the holy days that are both 
eight day observances. We have Passover and then seven days of the feast and we have the Feast of uh, Tabernacles and then the eighth day. Deuteronomy 16, Deuteronomy 16, Consider another piece of evidence found in the name of this observance. It's called Passover. Why? Why is it called Passover? Well, it's, the definition is in the name. It's what it means. It means to pass over something because of what happened in Egypt when the death angel passed over the houses of the Israelites who had marked their doorposts or their... Um, lintels with the blood of the lamb. And so these homes were protected when the angel proceeded to enter all of the other dwellings and to cause a fatal, uh, a large number of fatalities at that time. So the angel came into Egypt, as it says in Exodus 11, verse 4, this angel came in about midnight, and therefore blood from the lamb had to be put on the mantel place or on the doorposts prior to to midnight of the 14th. And therefore, the Passover lamb had to be killed before the death angel came into Egypt. It was killed before midnight on the 14th and eaten before that time. It was not killed the following day, the following afternoon. And this leads us to another indisputable fact. What day did Israel leave Egypt? Some will say that can't exactly be known, but it can be known what day Israel left Egypt because some people actually claim that Israel left Egypt shortly after midnight on the 14th, just moments, if you will, after the death angel passed over that they gathered their stuff and they went out their door and started heading out of Egypt. But this belief, it comes from a misunderstanding of Deuteronomy 16 and verse 1 where God said to observe the month of Abib and keep the Passover to the eternal your God in the month of Abib, the eternal your God brought you out of Egypt by night. But what night was it that they were brought out of Egypt? Was it the night of the 14th? No, it was not. It was the night following. It was after the daytime portion of the 14th, and they went out on the evening of the 15th in Exodus 12. If you go back there, again, I should have had you put a ribbon in your, in your book. Exodus 12. And we are going to read, if I can get there, verse 8, Exodus 12 and verse 8, where it says, that they shall eat the flesh on that night, the night of the 14th, roasted in fire with unleavened bread and with bitter herbs, they shall eat it. And speaking of this same event, if you jump down to Exodus 12 and verse 22, you shall take a bunch of hyssop, dip it in the blood that is in the basin, strike the lentil in the two doorposts that is in the basin, and then it says, none of you shall go out of the door of his house until the morning. This is a commandment from God. And if you think about it, consider all of the horrific events that, were t that would take place that night when the death angel came and went through tens or hundreds of thousands of homes and there was not a home that was not protected where there wasn't one that had died, it says. All of the screams, the wails of the people, the great agony that the families would have felt when their firstborn had died in the home. And then the fact that God said, don't go out your door until the morning. Would anyone in their right mind go out of the door that night? Not in your life. None of us would go out. It, that would just be a foolish, absolutely foolish thing to do. So they didn't go out that night as some claim. They did not go out until the next morning when the sun began to rise. 
That is when they had gathered their belongings. That is when they gathered their herds. That is when they loaded up their carts and further plundered the Egyptians at that time. And then they went out and headed toward Ramesses. In Numbers 33, Numbers 33, for further evidence of the night that they went out of Egypt or were brought out of Egypt. Numbers 33 and verse 1. These are the journeys of the children of Israel who went out of the land of Egypt by their armies or their ranks under the hand of Moses and Aaron. Now Moses wrote down the starting points of their journeys at the command of the Eternal. And these are their journeys according to their starting points. They departed from Ramesses in the first month on the 15th day of the first month. On the day after the Passover, the children of Israel went out with boldness in the sight of the Egyptians. For the Egyptians were burying all their firstborn whom the Eternal had killed among them. And so the, in verse 5, the children of Israel moved from Ramesses and camped at Succoth. So hundreds of thousands of Israelites did not load up carts, did not gather their flocks, did not move from, uh, their, gather their herds and move from Goshen to Ramesses sometime after midnight, but before 6 a.m. on the 14th. In fact, I've watched several archaeological documentaries over the years, and the evidence suggests that the Israelite homes in the land of Goshen were anywhere from between 15 to 50 miles from the location of Ramesses. So it would have taken all day to, to, to move nearly 2 million people with all of their belongings and their flocks and herds from Goshen to the location of Ramesses. And it wasn't until they got to Ramesses that, they be, that the sun set and it became the 15th and then they moved from Ramesses to Succoth. And this happened, as it says, the day after the Passover and they went out with boldness while the Egyptians were burying their dead. Matthew 26. So there is a undeniable amount of evidence in the Old Testament of when the Passover was to be observed. <clears throat> and understanding what God had commanded and what actually took place, what did Christ do in order to properly observe Passover? Because he is our example. And so we must recognize what the Savior did as a faithful servant and a worthy sacrifice for the sins of humanity. And with the level of passion and the commitment that Christ had to God the Father and to his people, we can be sure that he observed Passover on the proper day. Now Christ, as was mentioned in the sermonette, Christ said to his disciples in Luke 22 and verse 15 that with fervent desire he had desired to eat this Passover with them before he suffered. And so when preparing for his final Passover meal in Matthew 26 and verse 17, on the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Jesus, saying to him, Where do you want us to go to prepare for you to eat the Passover? Again, we see this interchangeable use of Feast of Unleavened Bread and Passover. It says the first day, and then it, but of the word feast is actually in italics, meaning it's not in the original text. It just says the first day of unleavened bread. The disciples came to Jesus saying, where do you want us to go to prepare the Passover? And it's a reason because of this intimacy that the Passover has with the Feast of Unleavened Bread. In verse 18, in Christ said, go into the city to a certain man and say to him, the teacher says, my time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. And so the disciples did as Jesus had directed them and they prepared the Passover. And when evening had come, he sat down with the twelve. Luke 22. Luke 22. So we see Christ 
told them to prepare and they prepared and they were keeping Passover that evening. And in, in fact, Mark had also written in chapter 14 that the first day of unleavened bread, when they killed the Passover lamb, his disciples said to him, where do you want us to go to prepare that we may eat the Passover? And so again, this interchangeable use of first day of unleavened bread and Passover because it's included in this set of uh, days that are observed during the spring. And in Luke 22, and beginning in verse 8, Christ sent Peter and John saying, Go and prepare the Passover for us that, so that we may eat. And so they said to him, Where do you want us to prepare? And he said to them, Behold, when you have entered the city, a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house which he enters. And then you shall say to the master of the house, The teacher says to you, Where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large furnished upper room, and there make it ready. And so they went, they found it, just as he had said to them, and they prepared the Passover. So if this was not a Passover meal, if it was simply a supper, uh, a pre-Passover supper as some claim, if it was changing the Passover or simply just having kind of a social event, Christ would have made that kind of transference or that kind of event very clear. He would not have called it the Passover. When his disciples said, where do we go to prepare the Passover? He would have said, well, it's not really the Passover. We're just getting together and having a meal. But he did not do this at all. Instead, we see that both he and his disciples referred to that night's activity as an observance of Passover. And there's no one questioning Christ saying, well, why are we keeping this on the 14th at evening if we're supposed to keep it tomorrow or in the afternoon? Nobody questioned that at all. They did exactly as instructed because they knew this is how the Passover should be kept. Well, the Jews, well, they kept a different observance, a preferred, if you will, tradition of, of um, slaying the Passover lamb the day following. So this meal that Christ and his disciples had, it was not just a social event. And the Apostle Paul was instructed exactly how the Passover should be kept by the New Testament church. And he said in 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 20 that when you come together in one place, he said it is not to eat the Lord's Supper, as some claim that it was. No, he said it's, that's not what it is. It's Passover, and though this event may have um, been a meal to some at one time, Paul said, don't treat it disrespectfully. No, in fact, he even advised people that if you're hungry, eat at home. Don't come to Passover waiting to be indulged, waiting to eat and drink and be merry. Keep it with somber humility and in a spirit of uh, gratefulness for what Christ had done for us. So you need, do, do not keep it in, with a festive attitude. And so Christ kept the 14th of Abib, also called the 14th of Nisan, and he is our example to follow. And we are to walk as he walked. We are to do as he had done. We are to live as Christ would have us live. And so we see then that the only change that was made to this observance of Passover was the symbols. The symbols of the lamb and the blood moved to symbols shown in the bread and the wine. And this change was made clear by Christ. In fact, this is a personal opinion, but I don't think it's off track, that I think the symbols were changed by God out of kindness understanding that his people would live in different areas of the world, that we would live in different societies, different cultures all around the world. And in these different areas, how many would be able to take a lamb, to set it apart for 10 days and to keep it in your home, then to slaughter it in your backyard and to roast the entire thing by fire? How many of us could actually do that? When Christ did change the symbols of that, that fateful night, Christ gave a command in Luke 22, Luke 22 and verse 19. It says that he took bread, he gave thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do this 
in remembrance of me. And likewise, he took of the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. And so, this is a command from God. It is not if you want to do this. No, he's saying do this. Do it in remembrance of me. Keep the Passover as he would have us keep it. Not on a different day, not at a different time, not with different symbols. Christ led by example, and he expects his faithful people to do just as he did, just as he instructed. 1 Corinthians 11 The Apostle Paul did not gather his conclusions regarding the Passover, regarding doctrine of the Church of God. He did not gather them by the precepts or traditions of men. In fact, he said to the Galatians that he makes known to you, brethren, the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man, neither I received it from man, nor was I taught it, but it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. And then, in 1 Corinthians, in chapter 11, and in verse 23, he said, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on that same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And so what night was it that he was betrayed? It was the night that he kept the Passover. The night that the devil entered into the heart of Judas Iscariot. That's the betrayal it was talking about. It was the evening of the 14th, not the next afternoon or the evening following. In verses 25 and 26, in the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. This do... As often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. And this doesn't mean do it often. It just means every time you do it, do it in remembrance of me. Because some misuse this scripture and say, well, we should partake of uh, a drink symbolizing his blood every week or every month. No, it means once a year. But when you do it, you are doing it in remembrance of Christ. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. What is the Lord's death? 1 Corinthians 5, 7, Indeed, Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. And several years prior to this, to this letter written by Paul, John the Baptist saw Christ beginning in his ministry, and he looked and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And if Christ, therefore, is the reality of what the Passover lamb that was killed and eaten by, eaten by ancient Israel on the 14th, if that pictures Christ, and in fact, he did change the symbols to the bread picturing his flesh and the wine picturing his blood, and he said in John 6 and verse 53 that unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. In other words, you don't have any part with me. So we can be sure, therefore, that Christ changed those symbols to bread and wine, and that he kept the Passover at the right time on the 14th of Abib. And if we only had the Old Testament to tell us what day we should keep the Passover, multiple scriptures point us to the 14th. And if we only had the New Testament to tell us which day we should keep the Passover, it tells us over and over again we should keep the 14th. And in the mouth of two witnesses, the matter is established, and we have more than that. Two set volumes of books, but we have many more witnesses than two or three. And so we can be assured that we are keeping the Passover on the right day at the right time. And so with that in mind, let's think about keeping it in sincerity and truth and examine not just when we keep it, how we keep it, how are we behaving toward one another? How are we behaving toward God? What is our activity as we are getting ready to partake of the Lamb that will save us from death?